And now, if you would, let me introduce you to my world record leg travel. Hey folks, do me a favor, practice CPR, catch, photo and release. The future of vision is truly in your hands. Hi everyone, Bob Nasekomer here for Grant Rods. You know, musky fishing's a tough deal. And the job's not done till she's in the bag. Well, how do you do that? It's pretty simple. You need big dog rods from Grant Rods. For your next rod, call them at 847-577-0848. Building custom rods since 1983. Big fish. Big fish. This side over here. That is a 50 fish. That's Folks, you're seeing it right now. My 100th just came in the net at Witch Bay Camp. Holy smokes, Rocky. He ate that thing. Hi everybody and welcome to tonight's show. Hey, I hope everything's going right out there for you folks. A little rainy out here. I uh, had a little bit of weather come through today. So um, anyway, um, we, had a, uh, we had a couple of interesting emails this week that I need to pay attention to. Um, quite frankly, uh, they were very enlightening to be perfectly honest with you. And uh, what I'd like to do, if you don't mind, is I'd like to go through some of those emails and bring you up to speed as to as to what we're going to do tonight and why we're going to be doing it. Um, I had a gentleman uh, that sent me an email, and I'm going to read it, sort of paraphrase it as I go through it, if you don't mind. But it says, Hi, Bob. I want to commend you on Fishing Sticks videos so far. They're very instrumental in fostering my interest in muskies. And uh, from a very young age, he's been watching our show since the Thunder on the Water days. And uh, he looks forward to more of the same kind of con content we're bringing forward now. Uh, that being said, he wanted to applaud us for uh, bringing Marv Kiley and the M&G spinnerbait to the forefront. And uh, he wanted to ask me a little bit about the big fish that... Um, that we lost uh, on an earlier show on a spinnerbait on a point. And uh, that being said, um, I'll tell you what happened with that. We had an enormous frontal system coming down. Uh, we had two day blow out of the northeast and it was blowing literally four or five foot rollers uh, coming through right down the right down the pipe on us. And all we did was finally get fed up with sitting there on shore and we decided to go out and uh, and work some areas so we were finding calm spots is what we were looking for and I literally went down alleys and alleys and alleys of islands until I hit the end of this little island had a little cabbage bed on it it was tobacco the big brown leaf cabbage and uh, that said um, she was there. Um, she was pushed back in that dead calm part of the lake and uh, was an interesting fish. We've showed the video here on our show previously and uh, it was an exciting fish. By all intents and purposes, one of the biggest fish I've ever had on, hook or line. And uh, it was really kind of fun. Uh, it really was. Um, but that was about it. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of, not a lot of magic to what we do. Oftentimes it's just frustration. It's just going out and dealing with the elements you have to deal with. Uh, one of the biggest things I've had to deal with over the years is the rumors that people say we've got people out hunting fish for me that they'll go up and they'll find a fish and I, I get to go in and fish behind them. That's so much nonsense it's unbelievable. I, I would bow anybody uh, to come forward and and go hand to hand with me, and whether it's on the phone or on the show here, and tell me how many fish that uh, they've gone out and quote unquote found for me so I could shoot a show. It doesn't happen that way. Uh, we have monster conditions just like you do when you're fishing. We have to deal with them just like you do when you're fishing, and we have to sort it out. And we try to sort it out as quickly as possible so you guys can get a hold of what's going on. And that's the element that we're dealing with most of the time. So tonight what we're going to do is um, 
We're going to take on another one of uh, his questions. Um, it's a pretty interesting question, to be honest with you. Um, he says he has a couple of questions he'd like me to deal with, and one of those is a conversation he had with Rich Tuomi, who was our general manager at Simply Fishing when we were doing that television series. And it relates to a muskie I caught, a 56 and a half inch fish. And the truth of the matter is, is he wanted to know why there was a five year generation between the time I saw the fish the first time and I actually caught the fish. Well, I want to correct him a little bit. I don't know if Rich misspoke or if the story has just kind of evolved over the years, but it was a three year process. Uh, we got up into the Lake of the Woods. We were fishing out of Ontario Wilderness Houseboats Rentals Limited Houseboats. And quite frankly, we were up in the gut of the lake, if you will. Um, we were so far away from where other people were fishing muskies, it wasn't even funny. Um, those that knew or claimed they knew Lake of the Woods at that time didn't even find us up there for five years. We had this water totally to ourselves uh, when we were there anyway, during that window that we were fishing, never ran into another musky fisherman, period, any place. And that being said, we were faced with one of the most irregular conditions you can imagine. This is in 1988. This is when we actually had hot summers. Uh, it was a summer of what we, what we call the drought. And the truth of the matter is, it was so hot in that houseboat that at night we had every fan going and every window going and ice sitting in some front of some fans just trying to cool it off so you could sleep. We're talking about temperatures during the day that were literally feverish. And at night, they weren't cooling off much either. But the year that I found the fish was three years earlier. And I was in there and I was pulling a jerk bait off of this little rock structure. And behind the rock structure itself is a large, large cabbage area. And I'm actually going to explain this to Jim Gracca um, when we do the school or when we do the outing together up at Witch Bay this year. I'm going to tell him what brought me there and uh, I'm going to share it with the people who are there at Witch Bay with us and wanting to fish muskies with us during that week. And that's uh, the, th the third, basically the third week of August uh, 2018. But I was telling Jim that there are a number of things I look for when I start hunting fish, when I start trying to find fish. And one of those is find areas that will gather fish. It'll give me a society of fish. Well, I was using some of the fundamentals that I use to find fish in this manner, and I pulled up on this spot, and I'm bringing back a jerkbait, like I said, bringing back a reef hog, as a matter of fact, and this gargantuan comes out behind it, and she just sashayed side to side with it. I mean, she owned the world. I mean, she was going to do what she wanted to do, and there was no offensive bets about it. She was going to rule the world. And that said, I worked her and worked her and worked her for the time we were there, and I just couldn't get this fish to perform. Couldn't do it. Came back the next year and uh, uneventful. Well, what we did that following winter is we decided to start researching really what we were doing. We were taking extremely uh, frequent pH readings. We were taking extremely frequent oxygen level readings. We were carrying very sophisticated lab equipment with us so we could literally take dissolve oxygen levels in the lake we were fishing and we were trying to correlate when we were seeing our fish as opposed to when we were not seeing our fish and then being able to draw from that where we were seeing our fish. And all that said, we learned a mountain full of information. I mean, a mountain full. My boat was literally a laboratory for years and years and years. I, I developed the matrix. Uh, I developed a, an algorithm that really breaks down musky fishing to the nth degree as part of this. Well, let's jump forward slowly. As we started to understand what was going on with the water temperature and what was going on with the pH levels and what was going on with the oxygen levels, we became better anglers, a lot better anglers. And then we started to sew into that John Alden Knight's Solner tables because I still to this day, to this very moment, believe there's an influence in those periods. And if you know where you need to be and you put yourself in those periods, chances are pretty good you have an opportunity. So all that said, 
jump forward to the point where we make contact with the fish. Um, after Mike Giefer and I had seen the fish the year previous and I couldn't get the fish to go, Dr. John Schneider drew the short straw and he was going to be in the boat with me that week and we were going to work hard. And I told John, I said, John, listen, we're, we're going to fish a good deal on a couple of fish, about five, five really big fish. And we're going to focus on the intel that we've derived over the last three or four years and we're going to start to implement this as opposed to throwing it at the wall, if you will, and seeing what sticks. And the second day we were there, um, I pulled this fish up and I just went, oh my goodness. Now, John's in the back of the boat, didn't get a chance to see it, uh, didn't, wasn't there. And it was out on the face, it was out on the same place that I had seen it before. But our conditions turned incredibly sunny and incredibly hot and that forced, forced that fish to do different things. What we were looking at in those days, folks, was an element that that was, we were talking about dissolved oxygen, okay? And this is referring, this is referring to, I got to get this really right for you. Give me a second here. It refers to the level of free non-compound oxygen present in the water or other liquids. It's important, it's an important parameter for assessing water quality. And trust me when I say that if it's out of whack, the fish we're looking for won't be in the system. They simply won't be there. If we look at the importance of dissolved oxygen for aquatic life, dissolved oxygen is necessary for many aquatic animals as they use oxygen in respiration. It's incredibly important, especially where we're going here. Uh, there are a number of things that we pay attention to, bottom and cell sediment, organic materials, the, the, the body of the water itself, the content, the physical makeup, all of this stuff gives you some visual of what you can expect in terms of oxygen levels, but it's not the type of thing you can measure. You need the equipment to do that. And what I'm talking about is fertile waters will have a tendency to be way more oxygenated than infertile waters will. So if you're fishing a legotrophic systems, chances are pretty good you're not going to have the rich oxygen levels that we were encountering while we were on this particular shoot. And the use of uh, dissolved oxygen analysis, well, determines the health and the cleanliness of a lake or a stream. This is what I'm talking about. The fertility will alter that oxygen level. Um, use this to, if you will, determine the amount or the type of biomass the freshwater system can support. Uh, use it to determine the amount of decomposition occurring in the lake or the stream that you're fishing. Again, relative to something you can visually identify with without carrying very sophisticated equipment. The equipment we were using was laboratory grade equipment and it took not only a lot of skill to use it, but it was very fragile. Well, where does oxygen come from? In, in, the, in, the, in the world we're living in right now, in the fish that we're about, about to talk to, the oxygen we're talking about coming from comes from plant life. Yes, wind can induce the upper stratus of the lake and can change the oxygen levels in the shallow portions, but we're not talking about that. Yes, currents can change the oxygen level, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about the weeds. We're talking about the vegetation. We're talking about the home where these fish grow and where they survive. This is so key. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to take two seconds and I am going to shut up and I am going to let John and myself explain to you exactly what was going on, how we found this fish, why we found this fish, and then when we're done with this, we can break down some more of the elements that, that took us to where we're fishing. Schneider, on Lake of the Woods, we're gonna challenge one of the biggies of all time, a 56 and a half inch muskie. Our conditions on July 11th, 1988, were simple. Our winds were calm, our air temps were 80 degrees, our water temps were 82 degrees and our skies were clear. Folks, this is back when we had the drought, the era of the drought, 1988. 
As we break these fish down, we're also going to look at solar tables, lunar periods, and periods of activity that might enhance your capability or your probability of catching one of these fish. We're going to use John Alden Knight's solar tables to help us along. Let's take a look at our time of catch, 8.50 a.m. Take a look at your AM periods, your minors at 3.30 and a major at 9.35. A little ahead of the curve, but there's an influence nonetheless. Our moon phase on July 13th, well folks, we're dealing with a full moon. Sunrise 545, no big influence here. We're taking a look at walleye, perch, smallmouth, and sucker as the main forage in this area. However, we have another phenomenon to deal with called photosynthesis. Let's listen now as Dr. John and I discuss it. It's critical here, Bobby, you have a large food shelf with lots of weeds producing oxygen. So the forage has plenty of room to come in, feed on all the little zooplankton and the phytoplankton that you see in the water floating. And, uh, brings in the little fish, the bigger fish follow in. I think too, John, what you've also got in here is even early in the morning like this, this weed's already creating quite, quite an umbrella as far as the light is concerned. Most people come in here and they fish they fish this stuff, you know, moving in, and they're way, way back there in the back, and they think the fish have been all there all night. And that's not really the case. These fish most commonly, as the evening comes on and the oxygen ceases because photosynthesis ceases, move out to the outside edge. And that's where they'll hold up during the night because the oxygen is actually richer. As plants cease to give it off, they take it back. Yeah, yeah plants use oxygen as much as we do. That's correct. But they're making more than they use during the day because of the sun. So at night, when they're no lo longer making it, they're actually using up a lot of oxygen. So the real shallow spots that are weed choked by morning time have very little oxygen left in them. So as soon as the sun comes up, that whole process of, of photosynthesis starts over again. And bingo, the fish start to transition back in there. Yeah. They will lay in this stuff in the middle of the day. If you think about it, it's kind of like a forest. You know, if you look at it, the top part of it's real heavy to us. It looks like a weed choke bay. But underneath, you have lots of room. You have kind of like the, the tree, you know, trunks going down. There's lots of room in there for the fish, including big fish, to move around in. So the, it, if you can picture trees on a shoreline, that's what you're actually seeing underneath this water. Yeah, you're seeing all that space, whereas the canopy up on top is real thick. Let's break down exactly what we're talking about. Now, this is an aerial of exactly where John and I are fishing. You'll notice we have about 15 foot of water as our deepest influence in the local vicinity. It steps up rapidly to 10 foot and then up to 5 foot. However, the magic is right in a little area here we call a junkyard bay. This is the type of area where monster fish not only can inhabit, but everything that takes to hold them there will be there as well. Forage, comfort, everything that you need is here, especially in bright sunny conditions and extremely warm water. Check out junkyard bay areas if you want to find really big fish. There you go, Bob. Big fish, Bobby. Yeah. Real big fish. Now, folks, That's you'll notice the vegetation in the front. This fish right now, Look this muskie is actually pulling that. my 18-foot bass boat. Take your time, Bobby. I'm going to get everything out of the way. You want me on the motor at all? Now, you notice the guy in the back of the boat right now handling the net? Well, Dr. John's got an IQ of at least two times room temperature, and <laughs> he can't get that Beckman net open. How do you get the net out? And of course, right now we have a couple of audio tracks pulled down. Johnny, go for it. Now, John, being the sportsman yeah. that he is, believes that all big creatures oh, like Bob, this that is the should have at least a shot at getting away. <laughs> well, maybe this is what John go. considered a shot. Well, I guess you could say, folks, that's what you're looking for. Let's find out exactly what we were looking for. You note the vegetation just beneath the surface. Fact is, some little bits of it were actually penetrating the surface. Beneath that canopy of vegetation, be it milfoil, be it coontail or cabbage, there are open alleyways that these fish will use. We call them sub-vegetation superhighways. And mixed in that are smallmouth, 
perch, even northern pike, which act as forage for the muskie. Whenever they come in contact with this vegetation, they leave a scent trail that the muskie uses while in this environment. Now, truth of the matter is we have increased oxygen, dropped temperatures, and perfect conditions to harbor big muskies. God, this is a, this is an absolute pig fish. This fish right here is 56 inches long. We just measured her in the bottom of the boat, and I gotta put her back. Release her, let her go, Bobby. Oh. Oh. That's a king of the no, fish. No, Johnny, that's the queen. Right there. No better. Work her nice and slow. If you're gonna catch these big, big fish like this, these oh super gosh, fish, folks, you gotta this. learn to handle them. Well, <laughs> like I said, we put it together. Now, there were an awful lot of things going on. There were an awful lot of things that we were being talked about in that video. And we all know that we can be just absolutely mesmerized by really, really big fish. So let's kind of recap what we're talking about. The tree line, if you will, that we're talking about is critical. When that water temperature gets so hot that the fish slide underneath this canopy to cool off, you know you got water temp. You also have another element that's in there, the pH. Now pH is not something you can fish by because pH change, changes regularly in a lake throughout the day part. You can go in, drop your pH meter, get a pH reading at 10 o'clock, come back at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and it'll be changed it's almost without question. So consequently, pH isn't something you can fish about, but you need to know what it does to the fish. So let's assume for a second that that muskie likes to be at around 7.2 to 7.4, and let's say 7 to 8 pH uh, 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 level. So consequently, that being said, now there's a big scale too between 7 and 8. Trust me, it's not just a jump between 7 and 8. There's a scale there. So that being said, that's where that fish is comfortable. That's where that fish is functioning. This is one of the reasons that we don't remove fish from an area, take them to another area and release them, uh, because quite frankly, the conditions in being part of that, the pH, aren't the same as where you took the fish out of, and it can alter the fish, the physiology of the fish, if you will. What happens to a fish when the pH is out of whack is they can't absorb the oxygen. Now, we're talking way out of whack. We're not talking a 0.234, but we're talking way out of whack. If that pH gets way out of whack and you move it from one spot to the next, it can't absorb the oxygen. Now, it can drop down in the column. It can try to get comfortable. It can try to find the pH that it was relative to, but you will rattle the system of the fish. So you got to be aware of that. The water temperature. We've talked before about that water temperature being critical. When that water temperature is up at 80 degrees, which is what we had in this in this period during this, this particular shoot, there's no way you can catch these fish. So we were up at daybreak. I mean, literally off the houseboat as early as we possibly can. Our game plan was to fish until 10 o'clock each morning and back off the fish and go back after them late in the evening and take advantage of the coolest portions of the day. You know, this is way back in 1988. This is before we really understood, too, the real comfort zone of the fish. That said, John and I, up very early, we went out, we took oxygen levels. Well, we took oxygen levels the night before. Uh, during mid-afternoon, mid late in the evening, we took our oxygen levels and we were getting about 11 to 12 parts per million around our weed bed. I mean, inside of it, inside those clustered coon, coontail areas that we were fishing, about 11 to 12 parts per million. Now, the fish doesn't require 11 to 12 parts per million. It doesn't do that. But it's just like us. We can be in an oxygen-rich environment and it not harm us. If we go into an oxygen-depleted environment, we're in trouble. Fish is no different. They've got the brain the size of a pea, but the instincts are off the charts. So that said, as soon as that water temperature, as soon as that sky starts to diminish, that cloud starts to come on, or that evening starts to set in, you start to see an erosion of the oxygen levels and a differentiation of the pH levels in these weed beds. And what happens overnight while this depreciation is taking place further back in the weeds is the fish saddle out to the edge. 
They come out there and they become a predator on the edge. Now, we're, we're talking about edges where you've got slight pockets you can fish into. We're not talking about being buried in the muck and the mire of the weeds. We're talking about being out relatively close to clean, deeper water. Well, the fish goes out there too. So when we start early in the morning, folks, don't run to the back of the weed bed. Fish the weed bed in. Start fishing on the outside clean edge and work your way in. That edge is what's going to hold the fish. They're an edge-orientated creature. Because of the diminished oxygen and the alteration of the pH level in their environment through that night period, they've pulled out, they've found a comfort zone, and they're sitting there. Campaign the outside edge first, and then work your way in. Because as you do this, the daylight's going to come up on your shoulders, the photosynthesis is going to start, and you're going to have opportunity. So just, you know, just kind of keep this in mind. This is a weed oriented fish, it's not rock. Rock is a totally different animal. Rock does different things and rock does different things to the fish. But this gentleman that asked me to cover this, I wanted to make sure that we covered the details he was looking for uh, because he obviously has interest in trying to fish the kind of conditions that are visual with this fish. And I hope that we've we've done that in waters where there are low amounts of buffers that's the nutrients folks um, the nutrients help stabilize the the fluctuations of the changing in the water the chemistry if you will the pH the oxygen levels they're all altered by these extreme nutrients you've heard me say over the years I would prefer to choose darker water over clear water 99% of the time. Most of that is because I'm a low light predator myself and the fish I'm chasing is a low light predator. And I'm comfortable in that low light zone. But the truth of the matter is, is the fish is comfortable in that low light zone. And compound, compound that with, with bright sunny conditions and a fertile system and I have a broader window of opportunity, a huge advantage. I fish Osborne Bay of Eagle Lake, Osborne Nivens Bay. I fish them religiously. I love it there. And one of the reasons I love fishing there is because that water is so dark and it's so fertile that you can catch fish in a midday bright sunny condition almost, almost at call. I mean, obviously you've got other elements at play, but you know what I'm talking about. Your advantage is in your favor. You have a bigger window of opportunity. Clear oligotrophic systems don't give you this flexibility. They just don't do it. There are just a hundred thousand reasons why fertile systems like Osborne Bay, Eagle Lake are killers. Bring her back. Oh. Hold tight, hold tight. Hi everyone, Bob Mason over here. You know, I've got a place, a very, very special place in my heart. It's Osborne Bay. It's been excellent. Uh, Randy did a great job, the guiding service. Randy started taking us out when I was 10, and we've been catching big muskies ever since. The accommodations here are fantastic. Check out Century Lodge on Osborne Bay. Come on, bring her back. There, on your left, you can almost see it. One of the most magnificent sights on the planet. Lake Athabasca nestled just below the 60th parallel. Lake Athabasca hasn't changed in nearly a thousand years with its pristine shorelines, pure crystal clear water you can actually drink, and countless fish. Boy has she got fish that is for everyone willing to travel to Other Side River Lodge. From the magnificent world-class northern pike that prowl these waters to the oldest and biggest lakers on the globe, Athabasca has it all. Other Side River Lodge caters to the true sportsman seeking an all-American plan guided package with three incredible meals a day and memories you won't find anywhere else. Records have been broken by guests at Other Side River Lodge in the past. You could be next. Book your dream trip of a lifetime to Other Side River Lodge, where fishing dreams do come true. Call Cliff or Stella toll-free at 1-877-922-0957. <laughs> like I said, emails are coming in. You folks are helping us along here. You're spreading and sharing the show, and I can't thank you enough. I simply can't. Uh, we went over the 3,000 again this week. Um, I'm loving it. Um, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Um, for those of you who are watching the show or watch it in the post environment, I'm going to build a custom-made 18 bait. 
And for those who share, they share the show, they share this Facebook show, I'm going to draw from that name of people who are in that shared list, and I'm going to ship you a brand spanking new custom-made 18 bait. Yeah, that's not screwing around. That's a $30 lure, and I'll send it to you for the simple purpose of helping us grow. Share the information we've got here today. It would be greatly appreciated, and uh, I'm telling you, it, it's the easiest way to do it. If you would, email me, Bob Masacomer, bob.m at fishingstickstv.com. That's bob.m at fishingstickstv.com. And I will give you all the information you need. I'll even send you back a picture of the lure you can get. But you got to do me a favor. You got to get out there and you got to share what we're doing. That's what it's all about. Like I said, we've getting getting emails from viewers and they're coming in from all over the world. Fact is I was talking to a guy over in the UK yesterday or day before yesterday that's watching our show over there and uh, it is so gratifying to hear people compliment what we're doing because it, it's educational. It really is. And here's one of those gentlemen. He's not from the UK. He's from right here. Uh, this is Rory Smith, and Rory sent me a letter. He said, Bob, let me start by saying I'm a huge fan. I finally joined the 50-inch club thanks to your A-Team Assassin. So that, again, there's nothing more gratifying to see somebody catch their personal best on, uh, on a lure you created, designed, built, and sent to them. But that being said, he goes on to ask me questions. Um, he wants to go up fall trolling in Manaki on the Winnipeg River. And i got to be perfectly honest with you, I'm not a troller. I've said it a hundred thousand times, trolling is not my forte, but reading water is. So I promised him what I would do on tonight's show is I'm going to break down some of the areas that I think that I would go up there and troll if trolling were my gag. So, I, And I'm, I'm talking about some pretty big fish spots to be perfectly candid with you and um, I am going to let's see here where are we let's close this off I am going to start in Gun Lake okay now the reason I'm starting in Gun Lake is because there is a let's see where are we at here let me find you folks The reason I'm starting in Gun Lake is because it's close to the marina. So if you get up there and you really don't know where to start, you really don't know the water, this is a very easy portion of the lake to fish. Um, that said, um, this particular part of the lake has great opportunities for fall trolling. One of the things that you want to try to do is you want to try to look for shorelines that have got small outcroppings, not huge, small outcroppings, things you can butt up to, things you can hit, keep going, control your, uh, your depth of your, uh, of your presentation with either length of line or with downriggers. But if I were up here, I would be fishing this right here. I'm not going to go too far into this bay here necessarily. But I am going to skirt all the way up this stuff, all the way up this shoreline. And I'll explain to you why in a second. But I'm going to fish right through here. I'm going to go right around that little piece of structure right there, which will be key. And I'm going to work it right on up toward the marina. Now, there's a reason I'm doing that. And that's because, again, we talked about current before. Current is critical. It's even critical, more critical on the Winnipeg River if you're a fall troller because not only do the muskies relate to that current, but so do the whitefish and the moon eye and the rest of the other things that are in those waters up there that are forage. Everything uses that current. So I'm going to spend a good deal of time in Gun Lake fishing that particular area. Now, the areas that I want to come up close to are here. I want to make sure that I bring myself in and make contact with the inside running bait. I don't want I don't want that I don't want that uh, that lure to be let me move this up for you. I'm sorry. 
Okay, I can't get it up on the graph for you. So let me move up a little bit. I apologize. I can't get it high enough on the screen for you. I don't have it blown up enough. Anyway, short of what we're talking about, again, right here and south of that, where I was pointing before, are what I'm talking about. Another key, key element is right here. You see where this little soft shoreline comes out? That is going to be critical. Here's another critical spot. Now you're going to have to pay attention when you come through here because that reef is going to stick out. You don't want to jam the reef, you want to bump the reef with your presentation. More dangerous water right here up in the top of Gun Lake as you work your way up toward Manaki Marina. These are very good trolling areas. Now this is a simple trolling pass. This is something that anybody can get on, anybody can do it. Now one of the reasons when you have inclement fall weather and you have, oh, let's say, let's say you've got uh, a northwest that comes down and blows in some super cold water on you and you don't have any way of getting your hands on, on the elements that, that will warm up the system for you so you know you're dealing with a cold front. Well, that being said, you're going to start looking for southern exposure winds, winds that are going to blow south to northwest. Those winds are going to stack up water on the shoreline. They're going to create some of that oxygen we talked about earlier. They're going to be pushing along the shoreline with the current, so that too is going to bring those fish up to the edge. Remember, as you go later and later in the fall, the more vertical the fish become. So that being said, that is what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be taking advantage of that by fishing areas that literally when I have that wind it's blowing right into where I want to be fishing. So if I had wind coming across Gun Lake it's going to be targeting right into this area right here. So that winds pushing in there I have natural current going this way and now I've got a com combination of both of those elements that are stacking right in here and I'm going to have fish stacking in there with it. Now right next to where I'm fishing right here is Birch Island. Um, you're going to have people waving at you from Birch Island because this is critical and you might even want to wave back to them. They're pretty neat people. Say hi to Phil when you're up there. All right, that being said, let's move up to Little Sand Lake, okay? It gets a lot more interesting up on Little Sand. So what I want to do is bring the map up and we're going to be fishing, we're going to be fishing from this area right here up the shoreline we're going to tap this reef as we go past it and you see this clean shoreline right here that's what we want to come up and then as soon as we do we're going to come down this edge now that being said your trolling pass my trolling pass i don't know about your trolling pass my trolling pass at that point is probably going to cease unless I have a lot of production going on and there's a reason for that because if it doesn't produce for me I'm spinning off of here and I'm going right here folks and I'm trolling all the way around this particular structure now you can see I've got my marks on here okay why do I have marks on there uh, well because I fish it now I fish it summertime I don't necessarily fish a trolling period, but there are hard breaking boulder points to come off of here. This particular element comes out this way quite a ways from the shoreline itself. So when you get up in there and you start to make your trolling pass through there, you're going to realize that that little thing comes way out. And what that's going to do is it's going to create an inside turn here. It's going to create an inside turn here. You obviously have one here and you're going to have an inside turn all the way down here. So all of these elements are going to hold fish. Now the current in this system is right here. That's the current going through. The current in the system runs from the south to the north or the southeast to the northwest. Trolling is something around a little structure like this that doesn't make a lot of sense. It's very small. Um, but if you're fishing with downriggers and you think you can go up and cuddle to something like this, it being the only object on this side of the channel, oh boy, you might want to take a pop at it. 
You really do. But that's what I'm going to fish. I'm, this, is my, this is my pass right through here. If I'm going to troll this particular lake, this particular deal, late in the fall, this is where I'm going to do it. This is my little sand pass right there. That's where I'm going to spend my time. Now, I'm going to evaluate what I'm doing after that, and I might move away, or I might go up and make another pass on it. The elements that we have over here, um, they, they're not trollable. Um, yeah, you can get in there and poke around, but they don't give you the ability to lay your lines out and really start fishing it hard. Um, again, more of a summer spot. All right, let's move on real quick. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because, like I said, I'm not a troller. I'm just laying out where I'm going to be doing my trolling. All right, here we are. Um, we are up on big sand. Folks, this is magic, period, no matter how you look at it. So let me pull big sand up. Let me pull big sand up so you can see exactly what we're talking about. There are a billion places to troll in big sand. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. Um, if I were trolling this, let, let, let me, let, let's do this. Let's back off. Let's go right here. Let's start. Instead of going over here in this complex, let's start with looking at what we got right here. Now, big sand is a lake. Big sand doesn't have the current influence coming through it that little sand has got and that gun has got. Uh, big sand kind of functions more as a lake. So if I'm looking to troll big sand, I'm going to look to troll right here. Up this, I'm going to make a nice long trolling pass right through here. I'm going to come in here, I'm going to hit as tight to these inside turns as I can. I'm not going to miss this day marker, this marker buoy here for anything. And I'm going to work back in on this steep hard break. Inside turn, yes, yes, yes. Bingo, 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 reef rocks. Yes, 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 yes. And we're trolling. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make this pass right here. That's the pass that I'm spending my time on. Now, that's going to take you a good deal of time to troll that. That's a lot of water. And you're going to have to be paying attention to what you're doing. Um, if you run one direction and you don't get bit, don't be afraid to turn around and come back down the other direction. Another thing with trolling, we're pulling, when we do troll, we're pulling big, huge believers. We're pulling giant grandmas. And there's a ton of different lures that you can throw out there. I'm hoping one of these days these East Coast guys will get a hold of me and we can talk about some of the trolling that, that they do out in the east part of the United States because they've got it figured out. Um, I'd love to learn from these guys. I'm not a troller, but that area right there is definitely going to be a focus. Another focus of mine, how I approach it's going to be variable, okay? But you see this complex? I'm just going to circle this complex for you right here. This complex right here is definitely in my target. Now, I'm going to fish that, I'm going to troll that thing any way I possibly can. And I'm going to get tight to the rocks. I'm going to bang the corners of the reefs. I'm going to, you know, crawl up into the inside turns as far as I can. I'm going to comb this water. And if I have the ability, and again, I'm not a troller, but if I have the ability to do this, come around through here, around through here, back through the island, Come back around through here, back through here, down, around here, back up again. I'm going to figure eight this thing again and again and again. Why am I figure eighting this thing? Because I change speed, direction. I change the shallow lure to the deep lure. I've got all kinds of fundamentals that are happening simply by changing up the method that I'm using to troll it. That is definitely high, 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 high on my list. No doubt about it. All right, if we get up in the lake, further up into big sand, uh, I'm going to start you right down in here where we left off. We're going to come through here. We're going to tip the outside of this. And you can get closer to this. If I were to redo that for you, you can get closer to this if you want. You might even want to troll all the way around this. Come in, bounce your shore, pick up your hard brakes in here, skirt around this reef, come back around. And again, again, you're watching everything you're doing and you're combing yourself around these structures as you do it. 
And where you go from there is totally up to you. I mean, we're already we're already two days into trolling and we haven't caught a fish yet. So I'm not very good at what we're doing here. So that being said, that's another area that I'm going to spend a good deal of time at. Now, like I said, we're not going to spend all day long on trolling this lake. So let's get to the magic. I'm going to take you to probably the most deadly trolling spot in the entire Winnipeg River system at Manaki in the fall, late in the fall. This is not my choice for a summer deal at all. It's my choice for the fall. Folks, this is right here. I'm just pointing a big arrow here for you. That's the direction of the current. The current's coming through. The current's coming through right here, all the way through. That's the current. There are so many fish that you will catch right here running this depth controlled shoreline it will blow you away both sides of this okay you're gonna watch your depth you're gonna monitor what you're doing remember these marks on this map are in meters folks they're not in feet so you're gonna have a good deal of water going through there and you're gonna have massive currents underneath that bridge massive currents and these fish are gonna cuddle right up in there and they are going to be there for the taking. They are there for you. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. We'll be right back. We'll talk a little bit more about... The summer oh. sun never sets upon the Alaskan pike of the Unoko, in the heart of breathtaking Alaska. Evenings will be shared reliving the battles of monster pike. The midnight sun trophy pike hunt is on aboard the 67-foot luxury houseboat and you're in command. If you're not, you should be. Contact the Midnight Sun Trophy Pike Adventures by calling 800-440-7453 or email them at mstpa50 at gmail.com. Look at that. Oh, big fish. Big fish! just came in the net at Witch Bay Camp. Holy smokes, Rocky. He ate that thing. Like I said, this is seriously probably one of the worst presentations I could put on for you. And it's because I'm not a troller. I just don't spend the time. Trolling, to be honest with you, is a skill. It's a skill that those who do it day in and day out have refined. A good troller is to trolling what I am to spot on spot structure fishing. There's the variables are limitless in what you're going to deal with. If you're pulling baits with long lines or if you're pulling baits with down riggers, if you're pulling uh, believer style baits where you can really bring, really go in there and bang the rocks, the believers are great for that because they won't break. Um, or if you're pulling the lip type lures, some of them are more sensitive to rock contact and you can break the lips on them. I know the guys out east, the guys I mentioned earlier, are pulling baits out there with metal lips on them. And I don't know if they're banging rocks or not, to be perfectly honest with you. I know they're trolling very fast. There's another thing too. Um, when you're trolling here and you start to pick up fish in the fall, be conscientious of the speed that you're traveling, whether it's two miles, three miles, four miles an hour. Be conscientious of it because if you go back and reset everything back up and pull at the same speed that you caught your first fish or your last fish at, consequently you're going to start to pattern these things. And again, this is part of the skill sets. I had an opportunity to fish with uh, Kurt Fenton and uh, Bill Nyson. We, we did some trolling. I dug today trying to find that trolling piece for you because I took a pretty nice fish, but I couldn't find it. I just don't know where it is, and I wanted to bring it out and show it to you. Um, there are a few different ways to do it. People like to hold on to their rods while they're trolling. Uh, that's going to give you a certain amount of 
control where you tap the rocks and you can back off the rod, give it a little slack, let it come up. Um, if you're set up in a rod holder, then you're going to be banging the rocks and you're going to let the resistance, uh, the drag of the boat, break it loose or pound it loose. Uh, another thing too, if you're trolling and this doesn't necessarily uh, relative to where you're fishing, but you want to run with solid leaders, long leaders. Um, long leaders meaning 8 feet, maybe 10 feet, um, if you're fishing these really, really rock structures. Because your, your, your line is going to come into contact with the structure before the lure will. So if you're trying to do this with a short leader, you're going to do nothing but screw up your line. You're going to weaken it. And if one of these big girls does eat, you're not going to catch it. Here's another thing, too, I want to note, if I could, real quick. When we were trolling, uh, Bill Nice and Kurt Fenton and I, the time that we did spend out trolling, I was destined to catch fish on blade baits. I really wanted to go down deep. We had downriggers on. I wanted to pull blade baits on it. We just couldn't get them to eat them. And I don't know if it's because the speed we were traveling was making the lures, the, the vibration so erratic, so fast that it was over pitch for the fish. Maybe they couldn't sense it or it wasn't, uh, it wasn't attractive to them. I don't know, but we just didn't do well. Now, if we slowed down, if we slowed down to the two mile an hour range, two and a half mile an hour range, we could catch fish on blade baits. But as soon as we got up there where we were driving the big crankbaits and stuff, we just seem to lose effectiveness with our blade baits. Just food for thought. Uh, again, I'm not a troller. I would love to talk to people who are, and I would even go so far as to say I'd love to do another show down the road where we do a little bit more than just talk about where I might fish. Let's talk about how trollers that really do do it, do it correctly, because I'm not one of those people. I'm just not. I don't spend that much time on it. Uh, again, before I get out of here, folks, I want to ask you to please um, let people know we're up here. Please go out there and share what we're doing. Like I said, I'm going to draw a name from all of the people who share this video on the Fish and Stick site. Now, when you hit share on that, it shows up in a list, so I'll know who you are. And if you want to be you want to make sure you're being seen, send an email to me, bob.m at fishingstickstv.com, and let me know that you shared it, and I'll get you into the drawing. But I'm going to build a custom lure, and next week we'll, uh, we'll draw that individual's name out of the people who took the time and the interest to share what we're doing, and I will ship you off. Uh, a, a brand spanking new lure that I know you can catch fish on. There's no doubt in my mind you can catch fish on it. That being said, this is Bob Mesa Comer wanting to say thanks and for letting us come in your house tonight, letting us be on your portable devices. You know, it is what it is. Fishing is something that is just absolute enjoyment. We all like to catch big fish, but the truth of the matter is we all just simply want to catch them. So do me a favor, go kick a little tail. And we'll see you guys next week for more Fish and Sticks. Because next week we're bringing on Jim Gracca. Jim Gracca came up with a great idea. Uh, Jim is a confident, accomplished angler. And he said to me, he said, you know, Bob, here's something you need to think about. Um, if you look at the size of structure that we fish as anglers, and you really look at the variables that you have to deal with, they're almost out of control. And he has a real neat idea on how to break it down. So we're going to break down a piece of structure, and we're going to break down every element, and we're going to do it multi-species. We're not just going to do it for muskies. We're going to do it for the walleye. How do they work? We're going to do it for the smallmouth. How do they work? We're going to do it for the muskies. How do they work? Northern pike are not going to be in the mix. They're going to be in the summer pattern that we'll be talking. Those pike will be too deep. But the fish that we're targeting, the, 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 the muskie, the smallmouth, uh, maybe even in some cases largemouth would do the same thing. They're all up on these structures. They're all using them. And Jim Grack is going to come on board next week. And uh, he's going to send me over some information. I'm going to design an underwater structure that we can use as a teaching tool. And hopefully, if it all goes right, that's what we're going to do. That being said, hey, kick a little tail. We'll see you next week. And thanks. God bless.